And so, to begin, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't have any PowerPoint um, uh, presentations uh, with me, I'm, I'm sorry, but I do have a couple of... Um, a couple of pieces of uh, what I was going to put on PowerPoint, I haven't said printed on pieces of paper, so you can all take them away with you, and that'll be far more interesting than simply trying to memorize them uh, on the screen. Right, what if we actually cared about sustainability? Well, whatever we might think about sustainability, and whatever that word actually means, uh, which are points that I shall uh, deal with uh, later, I suggest to you that what you see before you at this very moment is a vivid indication of why our search for sustainability in its current form is doomed to failure. Because what do you see here? Let's think about this. Let's think about this. Yes, you may not realize the full nature and extent of what you see, but what you see before you is the essence of the problem. Because, although I must uh, proudly plead guilty to a spot of innocent environmental activism in my younger days, nevertheless, tonight, I am speaking to you not as a cool, young, sexy environmental activist, I wish, uh, but as a lawyer, uh, a lecturer in environmental law. Now, you know this, unless you have just wandered in here by mistake. But what this means is that sustainability, which is essentially nothing more or less than the long-term survival of our species and of our world, the most precious thing in the world, the future, life itself, the magic and poetry and beauty of the world, the divine miracle of creation, all of this is now something that we have handed over to lawyers to deal with. Now, lawyers fulfill a useful function in society, and in the last resort, they only do what people want them to do and work through the laws which we have more or less democratically made. If there were no bad people, it is said, there would be no good lawyers. <laughs> we, we need them. Thank you, sir. We all, we all use them, and I am not going to mock them. They do have their excesses. Your highly paid uh, uh, American corporate lawyer is someone uh, of whom we are generally right to be suspicious. But all the same, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you were as horrified as I was by the, uh, by the five o'clock news tonight uh, that uh, Al-Qaeda has just uh, hijacked an entire plane load of highly paid American corporate lawyers and are holding them hostage at uh, Washington airport. And they are threatening to release one every hour until their <laughs> demands are met. <laughs> okay, but... We've, we've handed the, the issue, this vital issue of a good and healthy environment, fit for children and other living things, over to lawyers and legal processes. Now, with the greatest of charity, the law, at the best of times, is a pretty crude instrument for doing anything, let alone working towards a future ideal of restraint and responsible use. Arthur Kersler, of course, said that the date, the 6th of August, 1945, was the most significant date in human history. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you may run the gauntlet of reproachful eyes and sit at the front where there are pieces of paper and seats uh, waiting for you. Right, right, uh, the 6th of August, 1945, that was the day on which human beings announced that uh, they had the power to destroy the world. You remember Robert Oppenheim saying, I am becoming death, the destroyer of worlds. But we all have uh, terrible powers, not just nuclear scientists. Terrible dangers and terrible temptations uh, face us. And as... And, and, and we've, we've abandoned the struggle, and we have handed it all over to the law. And as for the law, we still have, in fact, what we had before the Resource Management Act was made, the orderly degradation of natural resources. Nothing has actually changed. And all we can suggest by way of correction to the state of affairs is to make more laws or different laws about it, as if we didn't have enough laws already, as if the Resource Management Act, when it was made, was as good as we could make it. Well, laws are a start. We have to have laws, of course. But here is another problem. Uh, revealed again in the fact that it is a lawyer who is speaking to you, nearly all of our environmental law is shaped as intervention. People want to do things with their own property or with nearby public resources that seem to be available. Uh, and our law, under the Resource Management Act, whether we're talking about uh, resource consent applications or earlier at the planning stage, our law is something that steps in at this point uh, and restricts people's freedom for good or ill. The law is an interference with freedom, or so it's perceived, an impediment to the exercise of our natural rights to do what we want to do with our own property. Now, 
This approach, I speak of course with the wisdom of hindsight, is never going to work. The Resource Management Act, despite initial hopes for something different, has fulfilled Mr John Milligan's uh, predictions, which were widely dismissed as cynical at the time, that under it our planning laws would continue to muddle along, along more or less uh, uh, familiar paths. It is impossible now, I think, to remember, well, we can remember, but it's impossible to realise, if you weren't there, what immense optimism greeted the appearance of the Resource Management Act. It was going to solve all our problems. For several years, I was regularly treated to free dinners uh, by environmental lawyers from overseas visiting Christchurch who'd phone me out of the blue at the faculty faculty and ask me to uh, uh, have a free dinner with them and tell me about this exciting new world leader of a law. People would read section 5, the purpose of this act is the sustainable management of natural and physical resources. Here I refer you to your first piece of paper, there it is, section 5, the purpose of this act is to promote the sustainable management of natural and physical resources. And people would read the splendid definition of sustainable management which followed and it was clear that paradise was just around the corner. Everything is there. Look at it. Yes, enabling people and communities to provide for their social, economic and cultural well-being and for their health and safety while da 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 long-term environmentally responsible things. So, what went wrong? Why didn't the Resource Management Act usher in paradise? Well, the essential reason, I say, is that our society just is not organised in a way that makes sustainability an appropriate and useful concept. But let me make some, and I'll get back to that, but let me make some other observations also. And the first, of course, is that you should uh, never believe uh, people who promise you paradise. Uh, there is that sound rule of common sense, which we apply in other uh, areas of life, which we apply here also, we should apply here also, that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, when people are offering you 40% offering you interest on, the, uh, on your life savings, uh, cast iron, guaranteed. Sustaining people and communities and making them healthy and wealthy and wise and developing and using nature and at the same time being far-sighted and environmentally responsible, it's wonderful, but it is too good to be true. Professor Donald Worcester, I may quote at this point, an American uh, historian and writer who says, he, he wrote an essay saying that sustainable development essentially was sustainability, sustainable management, sustainable development, it's all one of the same, these nouns mean nothing. Uh, uh, sustainability was the coward's way out. And he said that in the 1960s and 1970s, before the goals of environmentalism became clouded by political compromises, uh, it was clear that the only way to save the world was by limits to growth in several areas, limits to population, limits to technology, and limits to appetite and greed. And, if I may quote him, he wrote, Underlying that was a growing awareness that the progressive, secular and materialist philosophy on which Western civilization has rested for the past two or three centuries, having successfully eliminated or at least rendered impotent the ancient structures of custom, religion, culture and law in its way, this philosophy, now embraced, of course, by most of the world, uh, is deeply flawed and ultimately destructive to ourselves and the whole fabric of life on the planet. So the only certain way to the environmental goal was to challenge uh, this philosophy at its foundations and to find a new one based on material simplicity and uh, spiritual richness. And that was the general idea, but it was so painfully difficult to make that uh, turn, to go in a di diametrically opposite direction. And so in the 1980s, the far less strenuous alternative of sustainable development appeared most notably in the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future, uh, you remember, but in other works also. A new broad coalition, a new progressive environmentalism, not sending us all back to grass huts and homespun jerseys, but something that could unite the environmentalist and the developer, the capitalist and the socialist, the scientist and the economist, the impoverished masses and the urban elite. And it was very popular precisely because it lacked any real core of meaning. And this, indeed, has been remarked uh, on uh, uh, in the in connection with the Resource Management Act's own definition of, of sustainability. 
environmentalists who started off uh, by believing that the term uh, sustainable management uh, really meant something, because after all, Section 5 was very carefully crafted, they were deeply dismayed as early as 1994, when Mr Justice Gregg in the High Court observed, point two, that this part of the Act expresses in ordinary words of wide meaning the overall purpose and principles. It is not, I think, a part of the Act which should be subjected to strict rules and principles for statutory construction, which aim to extract a precise and unique meaning from the words used. There is a deliberate openness about the language, its meanings and its connotations, which I think is intended to allow the application of policy in a general and broad way. In other words, we all know what it means. We don't have to worry about the words too much. In other words, it is a platitude. It is motherhood and apple pie. It is, to use Dr. Williams' words, which I'll use again later, it is sugar and spice and all things nice. And although that came as a shocking statement at the time, there really is no other way to interpret it. It could be interpreted to require an environmental bottom line. You could find uh, in there a requirement that people and communities can provide for themselves only if the long-term environmental considerations are respected. If you look at the word while, just before paragraph A, uh, if you could interpret while to mean if, and you could interpret the act to mean that sustainable management means managing things for people if, a, B, and C are respected as well. But really, there was not much else in the Act to insist that that was the interpretation. Uh, and to interpret while to mean if, to actually to require deep respect for the environment all the time, would shut our country down. And so Section 5 has become a platitude. Uh, last year, uh, I, I did some elementary detective work in the New Zealand law reports, uh, which are not the environmental law reports for New Zealand, but just the standard ones dealing with the High Court and Court of Appeal. And the last time that the phrase sustainable management was discussed in any judgment uh, in those law reports was in 2003, uh, 10 years ago. So, sustainability is, uh, is a platitude, and as a concept, if you were to wrestle with sustainability, all sorts of difficult questions uh, pop up. Theoretical writers, not ones writing about New Zealand law, uh, have difficulty with the concept uh, of sustainability, because they say it seems a very arrogant idea, putting human beings in charge. We are the managers, the developers, and what do we know? In the great struggle of life and politics and economics, can we seriously expect that we are going to succeed in making sure that sustainability wins through? We can hardly manage our own lives, and here we are being put in charge of managing the earth. This is simply not going to happen. And then other questions, how long is the sustainability to last? Is it to be forever? Well, that would be absurd. <laughs> but how long then? Just the next generation, the next hundred years? What are we talking about? And what degree of sustainability? Are we allowed to change anything? And if we're allowed to change some things, then where do we draw the line? And what exactly are we sustaining? Are we sustaining the economy? Well, we're more comfortable and prosperous now than we ever were. I'm not counting, well, let's leave the last four years out of it. Uh, yes, I mean, human, are we sustaining human health? Well, there are more human beings than ever, and certainly in some parts of the world, such as here, we're all pretty healthy compared to past centuries. Human, are we sustaining human institutions? Well, ours are surviving reasonably well. So if we're sustaining those things, we're fine. Sustainability is happening already. And if we say, well, we should be imitating nature and natural processes, that's the really important thing. Well, there is great debate among scientists and ecologists, I understand, about the stability of ecosystems. And some scientists uh, detect rapid change and unpredictability in ecosystems. Some go so far as to say that there are no such things as ecosystems. There are just individuals and individual species all struggling for life. There is no society, there are only individuals, which is, of course, the slogan of our time in many ways. Well, if that's so, if nature is constant change and development, why shouldn't human beings follow the same path? And after all, even extinctions happen in nature, so what's wrong with a few human-induced ones? So sustainability is so vague, and it's also, of course, so boring. Steady as she goes, be careful, it's repetition and stagnation. It's not very exciting or inspiring. So it's not a very satisfactory concept. It assumes that we have the knowledge and the skill and the willpower to respect natural limits. It still assumes that the natural world exists for the benefit of human beings. 
Um, the Brunton Report makes that clear on every page. And, and the sustainability ideal still seems to rest, or at least it's consistent with, an uncritical acceptance of progressive secular materialism, the philosophy we've had for the last uh, two or three centuries. The assumption is that that worldview is perfectly benign, there's nothing wrong with it, just as long as it's sustainable. And the assumption is, of course, that sustainability can be achieved by those institutions and, uh, and their values uh, intact. Um, and that's assumed even in such a progressive, enlightened, radical documents as the Earth Charter, of which more are known. But I suggest that the opposite is the case, that these institutions and the philosophy that underlies them are fundamentally antipathetic to environmental soundness. And if we look at the way in which the Resource Management Act operates in practice, we will see that it does comply with these gloomy predictions. As under the laws which preceded it, what we have ended up with under the Resource Management Act is a balancing of short-term human wants and interests and longer-term environmental considerations. And so the hard decisions are made in each case. In this case, what do we do? Do we respect the long-term environmental considerations or the short-term human interests? And in virtually every case, ah, the short-term human interests uh, uh, win out. And so we have, therefore, no more than a system uh, for the orderly degradation of natural resources. And I draw your attention to point three in Dr. Ian Williams. Speaking of the Resource Management Act, uh, in part two, who said that it's a source of bottomless justification and conflict. The aftermath of the 1991 reform reveals the antipathy and truth of Charles Dickens' comment that the one great principle of the English law is to make business for itself. That's very unkind. <laughs> but, but within the statutory elements, uh, statutory elements, the elements in uh, part two of the Resource Management Act, practically any decision on a resource consent application will be defensible, though no doubt some or one will be more defensible than others. Should we irrigate the Canterbury Plains or should we leave water in the rivers? Should we hack about the Canterbury Museum uh, or should we, uh, should we restore it? I mean, what does all of these things, any decision, any decision just about can be dressed up in terms of sustainability? The consents legislation seems to bear out the claim that resource consents are decided even in the environment court through a mixture of art, science, justice uh, and democracy. And so, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I am not as horrified by the current amendments to the Resource Management Act as many of my environmental friends. I'm sure that the consequences of these latest amendments will be unfortunate for the environment, uh, but they are no more than another step in the long dismantling of the Resource Management Act. Excuse me. I have an illustration. Here is the Resource Management Act as it was made in 1991, and I draw your attention to its thickness. Here is the Resource Management Act as it was uh, in 2007. There have been further amendments since, but this is the last copy I've got uh, uh, just by itself. And you will observe already that even in 2007, even before the simplifying and streamlining of 2009, <coughs> the Act has already grown to twice the size uh, that, it, uh, that it was uh, originally. Right, so the point I'm making then is that amendments have been going on and most of these, a lot of them have been clarification, uh, a lot of them <coughs> turned out that things uh, were rather more complicated uh, than, uh, than was initially uh, uh, supposed, but uh, a considerable amount of the amendment to the Resource Management Act has been in the form essentially of it, of, of it being watered down. And so these latest amendments will be unfortunate, not so much because of the words themselves, but because of the message those words send, that we don't care uh, as much uh, as we used to. And in fact, I, I must say that <clears throat> I'm disappointed that some of my environmental colleagues haven't been more agitated than they have been about the <clears throat> undoubted defects of the Act. Anyone with the slightest experience of the Act, and I'm sure many of you have, I know that some of you have, certainly. You can tell a hundred stories of bureaucratic delay and incompetence, of outrageous charges of tens of thousands of dollars for no more than a rubber stamp on a piece of paper. 
many aspects of the Act's administration are completely indefensible. Uh, they were never intended by the Act's uh, uh, framers, and it seems to me that environmentalists who don't object to them uh, do the environmental cause uh, considerable harm. And yet we do obviously need some oversight or control from some source. We can't leave it completely to people to make their own decisions, free of any public or official input. How can we have the oversight without the bureaucracy and the expense? Well, there is a challenge, but I do, as you'll see, have some suggestions. The, the cynical interpretation of these latest amendments to the Resource Management Act is that they are just examples of uh, a government of rich men making things easy for their rich mates. But it is uh, uh, much more complicated than that, as I shall explain. Right, oh, well, let's pause here for a second. The topic of this lecture is what if we really cared about sustainability, and in the light of what I have said so far, you might well be thinking to yourselves, why should we care about sustainability? Well, I think we still should. Uh, sustainability is only a start, but we do have to uh, start somewhere. That lovable old cynic, the Duc de la Rochefoucauld, said that hypocrisy is the homage which vice pays to virtue. And we have to have sustainability as an ideal, however waffly and vague and unsatisfactory it is, because if we don't have it, we will have something worse. But I am not alone in thinking that at present we just do not care about sustainability uh, in just about any sense, let alone uh, what sustainability might uh, truly require. Now, some of you may recollect that the previous Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, Dr Morgan Williams, uh, made some somewhat provocative suggestions uh, in a speech just before he retired, getting a few things off his chest and then uh, scuttling out the, uh, the door. And New Zealanders, he said, were good at what he called environmentalism, that is, saving wild nature, preserving native forests, bringing endangered species uh, back from the brink of extinction. But, he said, we were not good at truly uh, sustainable management. Now, that suggestion, that was a criticism not only of the development uh, side of our nation, but also of the environmentalist uh, side of our nation. And it caused some resentment among environmentalists at the time. But I think it's true. It's certainly true of developers if I might use this generic term for the uh, innumerable people who want to do one thing or another, by and large, they just want to do these things in a pleasant way, doubtless, and avoiding public controversy and expensive litigation, if possible. But money doesn't grow on trees and hard decisions have to be made. But I think it's also true of the conservation movement, that uh, sustainable management has not been foremost in their thoughts. The conservation movement is chiefly concerned uh, with the saving of wild nature. It neglects the cultivated countryside, comparatively speaking. And when faced with issues in cities or the countryside, its natural instinct is simply to oppose change. Now, this may be a wise instinct, it may be a very wise instinct, this neophobia, as we call it, when rats display it. Uh, it is, we might say, the precautionary principle in action. Uh, change is often for the worse and therefore should be suspected, but uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily lead to constructive dialogue. Now, I shall return to this point uh, in a little while, but for the nonce, I would actually go further than the Parliamentary Commissioner and say that actually we as a nation are not all that interested in environmentalism and saving things either. Now, I know the rhetoric is that we are an environmentally conscious, conservation-minded, out-of-doors, healthy, vigorous, responsible young nation. And I dare say this is true of most of us in this room this evening. But self-praise is no recommendation. <coughs> And as an accurate description of our national character, it is nonsense. We are one of the most highly urbanised nations in the world. 85% of our population lives in urban areas. Certainly, many other nations are close behind, and urban areas, I think, includes small urban areas, but we are not a nation of, uh, of country dwellers. An enormous proportion of our population lives in the one giant, monstrous conurbation of Auckland. <laughs> we have ballooning, if I may use such a word, we have ballooning problems of obesity, diabetes, all the diseases, both physical and spiritual, uh, of the sedentary, inert lifestyle. Almost 20% of New Zealand's population was not actually born in this country. We have one of the highest proportions in the world of New Zealanders, citizens and permanent residents, actually born elsewhere. 
And even for those people who were born here, we are much uh, further away than our many people in this room uh, from the New Zealand of our childhoods. I, my childhood was the same, essentially, as most of yours, I think, ladies and gentlemen. I grew up in Christchurch, although a much smaller and simpler Christchurch than we have now. But I had farming grandparents and aunts and uncles, uh, and all our holidays, or so it seems in retrospect, uh, were uh, on farms and in small towns and camping by the sea and batches in the bush and so on. And from there it was just a, <coughs> excuse me, a short step <coughs> to bush walks and tramping and botany, ha, and all those things that have made my life such a joy. <laughs> what a Adam's ale. Mm. Uh, so, but, but, so, so most of our childhoods, I think, were along these lines, I, 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 I suggest. But, but New Zealanders are not like that now. Like Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront, the crickets make them noivous. Um, and if I might offer uh, some anecdotal evidence uh, in support of this, I draw your attention uh, to this interesting table of forest and bird membership figures, um, which was a table that I compiled and it appeared in, a, in an article I wrote um, uh, several years ago, and I've been updating it um, uh, since. And uh, it's a bit hard to get your handle on Forest and Birds, uh, uh, get a handle on Forest and Birds membership because it's got half a dozen different categories. But I achieved a sort of notional uh, number of members by taking, as you see, the annual income from subscriptions, which appears in the left hand column, and then dividing it by the single adult subscription for that year and getting on the right hand side a notional number of single adult equivalent members. And you'll see that in 1973, which is the year that I joined, uh, I was still a student, uh, we got, uh, we, uh, Forest and Bird had 9,000 um, plus uh, notional members, and then the number slowly crept up with, with a few blips, um, the trend is the thing. And you see all through the 1970s and 80s, the number was increasing. This, this was when there were the great battles about uh, native forests. Uh, in particular, 1987 was the year that the Department of Conservation was formed, but still the numbers crept up, and they peaked in 1991, you see, at 20,000, whether by coincidence or not, that was the year that the Resource Management Act was made. And then, you see, after that, they plunged catastrophically. Possibly, why was that? Was it Part of the reason might have been that people thought, oh, we've got the Department of Conservation, we've got the Resource Management Act, we can save our subscription now. Uh, but that can't be the reason why the uh, numbers have continued to plummet, because uh, for the last, 1991, for the last 22 years, those numbers have been going down. And now, you see, we are back at almost exactly the same uh, uh, number of uh, members, uh, notional members, uh, that Forest and Bird had in 1973. And in the meantime, of course, the population of our country has grown by a third or so. And so as a proportion of the population, Forest and Birds membership is even smaller. Now, I suggest that, I just offer that, I, we could spend a lot of time on anecdotal evidence, but I suggest that the environment is actually waning as an item of public concern. Now, this is deeply paradoxical, perhaps, when a worldwide environmental crisis is deepening. But in another way, it's not, for other things have also changed since we were young and the Resource Management Act was made. We did not need the electricity which a raised Lake Manapuri would generate. It was just going to a foreign-owned aluminium smelter. We didn't need the timber from native forest logging on the west coast in the central North Island. It was done chiefly to provide employment in a few small logging towns uh, and employment in the forest service itself, of course, uh, and the timber was mostly waited, wasted. But now, every development opportunity which we are asked to forego comes at an actual cost which we are all dimly aware of. Dairying comes at a very high environmental cost. It is industrial agriculture. Yet without it, our economy would collapse tomorrow. So it stays. We protest against mining. But then we get into our motor cars made of metal and plastic and fueled by fossil fuels, and all, most of it brought from overseas. And we drive home along good roads made from the products of mining to warm, comfortable houses and safe inside jobs with no heavy lifting. There's a certain inconsistency here. 
When provisions in the Resource Management Act for public participation are weakened, the general response of environmentalists is to decry this loss of democratic input. And that the argument is that ordinary people should be able to be heard. And environmentalists are very fond of democracy, they're friends of democracy, and politicians are the enemies of democracy. But I think it would be equally possible to argue the opposite, to argue that in, when politicians weaken the Resource Management Act, they are actually expressing the desires of the inhabitants of our big cities who have no environmental interest to speak of and whose chief concern is only that their own comforts and luxuries continue. And if that has to be done at the cost of destroying some remote river or mountain or forest they've never heard of and are never going to visit in their lives, well, so be it. Yes. I'm, and I'm sorry to have to say it, ladies and gentlemen, but the environmental movement in New Zealand, of which I count myself a proud, almost founding member, uh, not quite, uh, but I've, I, yes, I was very keen, I still am keen, but I, I got involved when I was a student, and still in my teens, and I have been uh, involved and interested ever since. But it does occur to me that the environmental movement has not had a great deal by way of constructive things to say recently. On mining, the environmental movement says... No. On dairying, it says no. On how we are to live instead, how we are to make a living, what has it said? There have been one or two thoughtful reports, I'll talk about one later, but nothing much. What contribution has the environmental movement made to discussions about electricity generation beyond opposing dams and occasionally wind farms? I know T.Y. Point uh, folding might, might uh, postpone that problem for a while. I would oppose the dams too that the environmentalists uh, are opposing, but it's not enough simply to say no. We have to offer alternatives. How else are we to live? Because if there is no alternative, then we will just have to continue living as we do now. Now, there is undoubtedly a deep wisdom underlying this negative attitude of environmentalists. At its heart, I think, lies an instinctive understanding that progress, as it's called, is bad for us. That all these developments lead us more and more towards a shallow, mindless cycle of consumption and physical and mental and spiritual corruption that they lead us towards the rat race, the erosion of ties of place and community until we all become mere isolated atoms and workers in a meaningless blind ant heap. There is that instinct, and the instinct of environmentalists to say no is the right one. But at the same time, it's not enough to say no. We have to offer alternatives, and those alternatives have to go far beyond mere environmental protection. The first rule of ecology, after all, is that everything is connected. You can never do only one thing. To change to environmental soundness, then, we have to change everything. The Resource Management Act is not enough. And indeed, if we do change everything else, then we will hardly need the Resource Management Act. Now, I've touched already on the subject of democracy, so let me say just a little more about this. Because, as you'll see, it, it fits in very much with, with my argument. Thank you. Yes, seven minutes past seven. Right, oh, we're doing well. Right. Environmentalists have hitherto considered themselves Democrats uh, because very often the environmental movement in the last generation or two has been, they've been popular movements in the teeth of political apathy or political opposition. But I think that this alliance of democracy and environmentalism may well turn out to have been no more than a mere marriage of convenience. Democracy, as it is practiced at present, means increasingly rule by big cities, because that's where the voters are. It means increasingly here running New Zealand for the benefit of Auckland. And that is inevitably going to be environmentally disastrous, as well as disastrous uh, in all sorts of other ways. And environmentalists, I think, are slowly coming to realise that democracy, in its present form anyway, is not compatible with environmental soundness. So in 2009, for example, sustainable Aotearoa New Zealand, SANS, produced <coughs> this report, Strong Sustainability for New Zealand Principles and Scenarios which, uh, and I won't give it all to you here, it's, I think myself it's rather over-optimistic. It suggests, among other things, that uh, environmental taxes be set at arm's length 
uh, from politicians for the simple reason that politicians would not set them properly because uh, they would, would know that uh, if would, they would not be re-elected if they did. And here are a couple of quotations, uh, points four and five. This is d set 20 years in the future, describing what was realised. <coughs> it was, and, and in the past, about 2015 or so, independent statutory authorities were established to participate in public decision-making. Some have an advisory function, while others have veto power and legal standing as guardians of the future. Joint decisions of governments of these independent bodies are mandatory whenever the integrity of ecosystems is at risk. Right, so we have independent statutory authorities, people appointed uh, to them, doubtless, or let us hope that they were appointed by environmentally conscious governments and are deeply environmentally conscious people, but these appointed officials <coughs> may have a veto power uh, on public decision making. Well, there's no democracy there. It may, it may or may not be a good thing. If we've got the right people in charge, it might be excellent, but if we don't have the right people in charge, whoa, whoa. And reading back a page, page 24, uh, after the observation that unsustainable decision-making processes were a deeply embedded characteristic of representative democracy, because politicians, not unreasonably, did what people wanted them to do in the hope of being elected in the future. And so among the other requirements were requirements as political parties uh, have these own statutes, and also a legislative framework was created that obliged politicians, administrators and judges to implement sustainability. So clearly the Resource Management Act is not considered to have implemented sustainability. The definition and objective of strong sustainability was clearly specified in legislation and the new constitution. All levels of decision making are underpinned by requirements to follow sustainability principles. Right, well, a legislative framework. Every, we have a supreme law uh, and we have uh, appointed uh, officials uh, obliged to respect and implement sustainability in the teeth of what the authors of this report uh, uh, recognise uh, is going to be a certain amount at least of widespread public opposition. Democracy as it's practised at present then uh, can't survive if we are to, in the, or in the view of the authors of this report, if we are to have an environmentally sound future. And why can't it survive? Well, here is the reason, and it appears in point six. Here, let us find a very, very wise observation of Edmund Burke, who said, and you'll forgive the old-fashioned monosexual language, men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere, and the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. There has to be a controlling power upon will and appetite, upon our desires, including our desires to ransack the natural world. And if we don't impose those controls on ourselves through our own virtue, then those controls will be imposed from without uh, by, uh, by some tyrant <coughs> or natural catastrophes or both. Democracy, more than any other system of government, requires virtue on the part of its citizens. Virtue isn't as necessary uh, if only blind obedience is required from citizens, but democracy requires self-restraint and self-control, the ability to postpone uh, future pleasures uh, for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of the long term. And so for democracy, we have to be able, as citizens, to rule ourselves, our own wills. And if we can't do that, then the state, in one way or another, will come to disaster. And some external force, some force from without, uh, a tyrant, as I say, or a natural calamity, or both, will force us to it. Now, it's interesting that from John Locke onwards, the underlying assumption of most, if not all, democratic thought has been an assumption of the abundance or at the least the adequacy of natural resources. There is enough to go around, enough for everyone, and that being so, the only question is how to share this out. But if we are approaching a new age of scarcity, then we will be fighting again. There will not be enough for everyone. 
It's perfectly possible to imagine that an environmentally sound future will involve misery for many and all those things which we now take for granted only for a privileged few. Now, I know that the Green Party and the Earth Charter insist that social justice and the standard liberal agenda, the end of poverty and all forms of discrimination, gender equity and all the rest, are part and parcel of environmental soundness. But I think that is nonsense also. I think that is a hijacking of environmentalism in the service of completely different political causes. Apart from anything else, it is simply not possible. Even at the best of times, even in the boom years, the elimination of poverty is an impossible political challenge. And when resources are shrinking, it is even more impossible if there can be degrees of impossibility, which of course there can't. And as well as being a political impossibility, it's simply a physical impossibility. We've got six or seven billion people on Earth now, at least a couple of billion more expected before the world population might level out somewhere around the middle of the century. Climate change is already starting to kick in. Peak oil is just around the corner. Ecosystems are overstretched and on the point of collapse everywhere. How is it going to be possible to provide even basic human decency and comfort for nine billion human beings? It is absurd. There is a fundamental contradiction between the desire for generous social justice and the realities of life on our increasingly crowded and ruined planet. The survival of the planet and of even pockets of civilization is only going to be possible at the cost of appalling human misery and death, and an end to hypocritical sentimentality on the part of those who are lucky enough to survive. And this is an issue, forgive me for speaking sternly, this is an issue for New Zealand as well as overseas. The Greens here, and I'm sorry, I'm, I just use them as an example, I'm not picking on them, I was a member of the Green Party myself once, briefly. <laughs> <coughs> I've been, in, I've been in all of them. Oh, yes. Uh, but the Greens, the Greens, oh, never mind. Oh, I've got a choice of possibilities. No, no, the Greens call for social justice. They call for more refugees, higher social welfare benefits, more generous public services, Rolls Royces for everyone. We are living beyond our means now. How can we afford to be more generous without environmental destruction? The agenda of the Greens and the Earth Charter seems to be out of touch with reality. It is still based on this belief of the adequacy, at least, of the Earth's resources for all human demands. It still holds, essentially, that where God sends mouths, he sends food. Now, we agree that that argument is nonsensical when Christians use it as an argument against birth control. How are you going to feed them? Oh, where God sends mouths, he sends food. But it's equally nonsensical when used as, uh, by advocates uh, of social justice. One thing which we will have to do if we are to survive is something which New Zealanders will find it very difficult to do. We will have to harden our hearts. We will have to repel borders. We will have to refuse to be inundated by climate change refugees and insist that our lifeboat must not be overcrowded, otherwise we shall all drown. Right, oh, so, democracy. What are our possibilities? We have three choices for the future. One is chaos and catastrophe. One is less democracy, with comfort only for a privileged few, and the rest of us in misery. This is all that uh, most of the world can uh, hope for, and it could happen here. But for the South Island of New Zealand, at least, I think even the North Island uh, may have difficulties, there is a message of hope. We still do have the option of surviving comfortably and sustainably, and indeed democratically. But as I say, we will have to change everything, change far more profoundly than the Earth Charter uh, imagines, because the Earth Charter still assumes a world structured essentially uh, as it is at present, only of course with the elimination of poverty and all forms of discrimination, etc., etc. Sustainability is like happiness. Sustainability is a byproduct of other things. Right, uh, what are those other things? Well, I shall get, uh, uh, get on to them. But uh, as I get on to them, let me say one more thing uh, about the, uh, the Greens, which is relevant, again, to what I'm going to say. You may have gathered that the Greens have irritated me uh, somewhat, not for their environmental analysis, which I think is entirely on the right tracks, well, more or less, uh, but, but for the rest of it. And one reason because I am irritate, I'm irritated uh, by them is because they seem to me to deny by their very name uh, a truth that New Zealand environmentalists have been preaching since my youth. 
And the message which we taught when we were younger was that the environment is an issue over and above and beyond politics. It is not naturally the province of any particular political party or school of thought. Whatever our politics, we all need good food and clean water and fresh air and refreshment for the spirit. And all political parties should be committed to making sure that those things exist. But the Greens, by their very name, deny this. They are a left-wing party, and their very name announces that if you are environmentally concerned, you have to be left-wing. And you have to agree with Keith Locke that America is the great Satan, and agree with Sue Bradford about the rights of the unemployed, and so on and so on. And this is simply not so. And of course, when the left announces that the environment is their issue, can we blame parties of the right for taking them at their word? Now, the environment is not a left-wing issue, and it is a grave disservice to the environment for anyone to claim that it is. And in fact, although I have just said that the environment has no particular political alignment, uh, I would now, I don't know if I'm contradicting myself uh, uh, here, but I would certainly say that while the environment certainly is not an issue of left or right, which are labels that are virtually meaningless these days anyway, right wing and left wing, they're both terms of abuse uh, in the mouths of, uh, of other people. But I would say that the environment is truly a, a cons and naturally a conservative issue. The precautionary principle, after all, is a truly conservative principle. We say that we have not uh, inherited the earth from our ancestors, we have borrowed it from our children. We have the responsibility to pass our inheritance, our inheritance on to our children, uh, undiminished and, if possible, of course, uh, improved uh, uh, and enriched. We are stewards of our inheritance. That is exact. That is the very principle of which which Edmund Burke constantly enunciates: that all of our society, its institutions, its culture, its structures, these are things which we have certainly accepted from our ancestors, but we have accepted them and inherited them in a moral entail, and are obliged to pass them on undiminished to our children. We cannot play. We must not play fast and loose with our inheritance, whether our uh, environmental inheritance or our social and cultural inheritance. A couple of years ago, a friend browsing in my library and looking at the, uh, uh, the environmental section remarked on what a good collection of radical literature, as she called it, uh, I had got. But I thought to myself, radical? Radical? We are foaming at the mouth reactionaries. We are not radical at all, or at least we're radical only in the sense of returning to our roots rather than in the sense of ripping things out uh, 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 by the roots. The, the true agenda for sustainability is actually a deeply conservative one. And here is a problem. If I may just recall, reculez pour mieux sauter before going on. People will not look after the earth unless they love it, and they will not love it unless they know it. And if they live all their lives in cities, varied only by an occasional holiday in Sydney or Bali or Disneyland, a trip to them all, then they will never know the country. They'll never know it and they'll never care about it. And yet, how are we to open their eyes to nature? It can't be done by education, by well-meaning teachers giving them lectures. It can only be done by genuine experience. And that, I fear, is practically impossible. It's perhaps not assisted by... Uh, environmentalists who may well tend to look upon other people as intruders and pests who should be kept in cities. Uh, and indeed, when you see the way some people behave in the countryside, you think, yes, they are intruders and pests and these animals should be kept in cities. But at the same time, if we lock everyone up in cities, then how are they to come to know and love the countryside? Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, impossible. But people have to know nature. And we live in a society where, for most of us, that is practically impossible. People have to practice environmental ethics. And again, that is impossible given the way in which most of us live. In cities, alienated from the earth and its rhythms and cycles, living in entirely artificial environments. How can we make environmentally responsible decisions? Sacrifice is going to be involved if we live sustainably. The sacrifice of many comforts and conveniences and freedoms which we take for granted. Why would we want to do that? We believe uh, that through this voluntary simplicity, even this frugality of life, uh, we can better achieve serenity and joy and human fulfillment, but many people will require living proof of that. 
So, it is not for lawyers to work towards sustainability. You're ra blaming the wrong persons. If you uh, blame us, it's not appropriate to criticise lawyers if sustainability is not achieved. Lawyers only do what people want them to. And if we are not living sustainably, it's no use blaming the law or big business or politicians or anyone else to find the person responsible. We have only to look in a mirror. Eric Schlosser, the author of Fast Food Nation, about how uh, dreadful fast food was for the earth, for, uh, for everyone who was involved in the whole thing, the workers and the, and the McDonald's, the people who ate it, in every single respect of fast food was dreadfully bad. But he did write at one point uh, in his book that he had to admit that in the last resort, no one holds a gun to your head and forces you to go into a McDonald's. Okay, there are the blandishments of advertisements and our culture and all the rest, but nevertheless, ultimately, it is your decision. Now, to uh, look upon sustainability then as a legal issue is to approach the problem from completely the wrong end. We should be looking at the other end, doing these other things first and at the same time, and then we will have sustainability as well. Don't expect lawyers to solve all your problems for you. The lawyer is not the problem. We are the, are the problem. And so, after all this, and after my remarks about democracy and the rest, what does sustainability require? Well, look, here's the, here are some observations and the start of a list. I'm conscious that I am uh, approaching the, uh, uh, the end of my time, so I've got just three more pages. There we are, and then a small poem to finish off with. Right, yes, yes, right. Well, for a start, sustainability requires an actual physical closeness uh, to the earth. Uh, by most of us. Not that we should all be farmers necessarily, but we should be gardeners or trampers or astronomers or fishermen or landscape painters or some such thing as that. And we should be, we have to live environmental ethics. It's not enough to have environmental ethics which simply exist in books for the guidance of farmers and uh, miners and foresters and, and have all the rest. We have to live environmental ethics by eating locally and healthily, by buying local goods, and by finding our pleasures in simpler living closer to nature. If we have fulfilling lives, we won't want to uh, fill our empty days with shopping and eating and playing computer games and feeling depressed. And this has the con and if, if, we, if that's the way we should live, then this has the concomitant that we should not be living in large anonymous cities, but in smaller communities where it is possible to practice these things and to see the consequences uh, uh, of our own actions. We also must limit our population. Size, grossness undermines all our efforts, all of them. More people undo all of the environmental advances we make. It's, it's pointless to, uh, uh, to, to conserve electricity if we have more people coming to the country or more machines which we ourselves use, which are just going to uh, uh, eat that electricity up. It's nonsense to say that greater population size I know some economists do say this. They argue that, oh, the more people there are, uh, the more ingenuity there is, the more brain power there is, uh, leading to problem solving and plenty. That is nonsense. If that were so, then Bangladesh would be paradise. <laughs> so, no boat people, no DPB for the mothers of 12 children by 12 different fathers. I'm sorry. We've got to be, si this is the problem, and the, here's a challenge. We've got to be sensitive, but we've also got to be stern. And it's a very difficult but necessary balance. We must be sensitive to the earth, but at the same time uh, 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 stern and, dare I say it, hard-hearted in various ways. And then more, we need more. We need agreed values. We have to stop, obviously, measuring everything in terms of money and uh, above a certain basic level. We have to value things in terms of it's very hard to do these things, very hard, believe me. Um, but above a certain basic level, we have to value things in terms of beauty and community and environmental soundness. And we have also to agree on our values. That's the problem. We actually have to agree on values. Diversity of thought, wonderful thing, freedom, think what you like. Yes, but... If we have diversity of thought, if we're constantly arguing, and if people are free to say, no, 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 that's completely wrong, no, 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 then, and th then they will lure other people uh, in, that same, uh, in that same direction, answering that same siren call, and we'll be back where we began. So we have to agree on our values, and that means a loss of freedom, as we disapprove of those clinging to an outdated individualism. 
and we will need saints and holy men and even just a plain boring old regular clergy of one sort or another to keep reinforcing these messages. Some sort, I'm not necessarily suggesting the established churches we have now, but some sort of religious, spiritual, higher thought observance will have to become almost compulsory again. For several centuries, part of the reason we've got into our problem, and we've all read uh, Professor Tawney's Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, in which he claims that uh, the, uh, uh, Catholic thought had to be uh, soundly trounced before capitalism uh, uh, could arise. For several centuries, the elimination of religion has been one of the chief tasks of our intellectual leaders and reformers. And that elimination had, of course, immense uh, advantages in liberating our minds. But it has come at a dreadful cost in destroying meaning and producing despair and, of course, naturally leading to a crass and brutal materialism. There must be meaning. And if we're told constantly that no religion is a pack of nonsense, then what is left for us to believe in material things? And the only rational thing to do is to try to accumulate as many of those as possible. When people uh, write, uh, and we hear plenty of them, saying, brave atheists, you may be among them, saying, yes, life is meaningless. We are simply pointless specks of life on some remote star, or so, I'm sorry, remote planet around a remote star. Remote from where is what I always like to ask. Uh, but but uh, yes, we mean nothing. Well, if we mean nothing, what's wrong with extinction? If we, what's wrong with suicide? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, you answered my question. Righto. So, so there we are. And among all this, our thoughts need to be all of a piece. We can't be schizophrenics, most of us. We can't be conservatives in certain areas and liberal in others. Uh, we can't, in the environmental field, uh, maintain the precautionary principle and believe that we should tread with caution and that all our actions should be hedged about with uh, restrictions and restraints. And at the same time, in all other areas of life, uh, believe that we should be free to experiment with new thoughts and ways of living and, yeah, do what you like. No, our thoughts are all of a piece. We will only be conservative and cautious environmentally if we are cautious and conservative everywhere else, which is, of course, uh, a, big, uh, a big challenge. But nevertheless, there you are. Environmental soundness, like all other good things, does come at a price. Our lives, our minds, our very thoughts must change. It will be good for us, but are we prepared to pay that price? Will we ever do it? Well, human beings do eventually come to wisdom, but of course only after they have exhausted all these stupid alternatives. We are trapped. I'm almost at the end, ladies and gentlemen. We're trapped in the way we live now. We are trapped. I can't l do without a motor car, neither can most of you. To live as we should live has to be a common exercise. For one person alone to do it uh, would be impossible. It would be an individual example of the tragedy of the commons. Uh, you would put yourself at a self-imposed disadvantage. It would be extremely inconvenient, not as fulfilling or pleasant as, as if everyone else were doing it, and it would do no good at all, because everyone else would continue on their, uh, their present merry way. We are in a progress trap, and we will escape from it only when, with great disruption, we are forced to. Not only our virtues, but our intelligence has atrophied in the comfort and plenty we now enjoy, which we seem to consider to be part of the natural order. But it is not. The first rule of history is that the good times never last. So we have storious, seriously stormy weather ahead. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But since I must finish on a message of hope, a message of hope is always compulsory uh, on these occasions, I thought I might regale you with a, a wonderful uh, poem by Phyllis McGinley, who is an American poetess whom uh, many of you sadly will never have heard of, and I wouldn't have either if my aunt hadn't had a copy of uh, her verses. Phyllis McGinley, W. H. Auden was very um, uh, admiring of her, and uh, she wrote, among other things, uh, a poem called Text for Today uh, about the rediscovery on the island or one of the islands of the Bermudas of the Cajal, uh, which was a petrel, rather like the mutton bird or the magenta petrel on the Chathams, which was also thought extinct. And the Cajal was uh, thought extinct for some uh, three or four hundred years before eventually uh, Dr. Murphy of the... Um, uh, American Museum of Natural History rediscovered it. Uh, and upon reading this happy news, uh, Phyllis McGinley wrote this poem. <clears throat> Amid the ills that ring us now, beset by news we cannot cherish, let us consider the Cajal, 
that petrel which refused to perish, in spite of gossip it had gone the way of orc and mastodon. Four hundred years ago and more, it built its nest, it spent its slumbers, at ease upon Bermuda's shore, in innocent, prolific numbers, a creature of the coral reef, credulous, gentle, and naïf. But then the hungry settlers came to find those pastures stern for ploughing. The bird was edible and tame, so everybody went cahowing, till by and by, beside the water, there were no more cahows to slaughter. Alas, cried all the scientists, alas, career so brief and checkered. They crossed cahow from off the lists and wrote extinct upon the record and man could boast another feat of rendering nature obsolete. But all the while, with stealth and skill, necessity became its motto, the shrewd, the shrewd cahow was nesting still on hill and bank, in cave and grotto, invincibly and by some plan four hundred years outwitting man. O oh, brave cahow, so stubborn linked to your own island, palmed and surfy, I'm happy you are not extinct, but got espied by Dr. Murphy. You bring us hope, you give us joy, whom total man could not destroy. You bring us joy, you give us hope, at any rate what hope is bred on. For surely, if a bird can cope so cunningly with Armageddon, and snug in unimagined dens await its season for returning, why, so can Homo sapiens tomorrow when the planet's burning, can flee, root, car, scrabble, strive, and rear its progeny and survive. Amid our ills that seem incurable, Kahal, you make me feel more durable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> ah, well.